I want to talk to you about labor, pain, and the forest. Um, so I came here uh, about a year ago, um, did a BXHB Starry talk last year, and I was really talking about being powerless and feeling really scared and out of control, um, especially with the political climate at the time. Um, now we're here about a year later, and um, political climate hasn't really cleared up or gotten any better. Sorry, guys. Um, but I'm going to talk to you about how I took that powerlessness and that pain, and I tried to use it in another way. So I'm talking about Western expansion, I'm talking about scientific expansion, economic development, you know, the whole thing. So I'm going to have these as a background. These are paintings that I painted. They're about um, the things that I'm talking about. So look at them or look at my face. Do whatever you want. Um, so <clears throat> uh, around uh, the time when I started feeling really, really, really powerless, this was around the time when I started looking at like exactly what's making me fear, feel powerless. Um, most of all, institutionally, policy-wise, what makes me feel like I have my agency taken from me. Um, so concurrent with that also came the onset of a lot of digestive illnesses in my life. Um, these manifested in ways in which um, my stomach would just be upset all the time. Um, fear of eating, for fear of stomach upset, for fear of pain and bleeding, and just like a feeling of loss of agency and control over the actions of my body, which um, manifested in weight loss and depression, and, you know, that whole sort of thing. So I looked at this pain and um, I turned to history um, and the history of pain and being women um, and how that contributes to it. Um, so historically, the forest has been the place for women. Um, also inherently, it's anti-capitalist. Um, the forest, <laughs> well, I mean, it doesn't account for capitalism. Um, the forest produces enough to satisfy, um, it produces enough for the animals, and if there's deviation from the norm in the forms of weather differences, there are ways for the forest to account for it. Similarly, the autonomous societies that women have created in the forest all over the world internationally um, and before the advent of Western expansion um, function in a similar capacity, um, living with respect to what the forest provides to you, um, making medicine and expanding science in an indigenous way of knowing, um, which is really different from how we function today in which we value economic expansion um, and scientific development, which is concurrent with enlightenment thinking. So. Looking at this historically, we start seeing with the favoring of this idea of economic development and scientific expansion, also the removal of agency um, of women from their spaces. Um, policy kind of basically kicked women out of the ability to get a wage. Um, policy also kicked women out of the forest, meaning that there wasn't a space for there to be autonomous discourse performed. Um, in a way, uh, th this also was concurrent with medical expansion in that the forest provided a lot of different um, cures for medical ailments. There was access to contraceptives of, um, what is it called, homeopathic varieties. You could make potions, you could make poultices, you could make salves. Um, but with the rejection of that and with the labeling of these things as mystical or magical, there is also an immediately derogatory connotation to them. So looking at this, um, like, taking away of women from their ability to control their pain, um, their ability to control conception and reproduction. Um, I also found a lot of solidarity in that pain. Um, historically, in the medical establishment, women have been uh, objectified. Um, they've been experimented on. Their bodies have been used as canvases to carve out um, whatever the ideals of the male-centered, Western-oriented, Western-dominated, male-dominated freaking magical establishment wants to do. <laughs> it freaking sucks. And although we've really expanded um, and we've kind of come forward in a lot of ways societally, um, the medical establishment kind of continues to be one that we don't really want to critique. Um, but really, when you think about it, when you are taught that what your body is doing um, is out of your control and when you're taught that that is somehow your fault, which is basically what a lot of the medical establishment does to you, then why aren't we changing that? That's something we need to like be focusing on. So I want to leave you with one last thing that makes you think about women and the forest, um, which is, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the story of the seven swans. Um, it's a German fairy tale. So basically, I'll go through like a really uh, abridged version of it because I know I'm running out of time looking at that phone. Um, <laughs> So basically, there's a king, he goes riding in the forest, 
Um, and his wife has recently died. He's really sad. So he's going hunting in the forest, and he gets really, really lost in this dark and mysterious forest because, you know, it's like the woman's place, so it's like you're going to get lost. And out of the darkness and the moor is this witch comes out. Um, she's an old woman, but she's automatically a witch because she's old, and that's what fairy tales are. Um, and she says, I'll lead you out of this forest if you come and marry my beautiful daughter. And he's like, oh, okay, I don't have a wife, and I'm, I'm looking I'm looking for a shorty, you know, out on these, on these forests. Um, so she takes him back, he marries her, um, but what he doesn't tell her is that he has eight children, seven sons, and one daughter. So he comes out of the forest, and he puts the children into hiding for fear of his new wife, who is also a witch, of finding them. And one day she finds them, and she casts a spell, and she turns the seven sons into seven swans. Um, and she puts the task upon the daughter to weave seven shirts out of stinging nettles and thorns and to work and perform this labor in silence over and over and over again. The shirts fall apart, her hands bleed, they become calloused. Um, and all this while she escapes to the forest and she's banished to the forest to live in silence and perform this labor in silence. Um, so I want to ask you guys, why is she relegated to the forest? Um, I just want you to think about the forest and women and pain. <laughs> All right, <laughs> have a nice day. <laughs>
As I researched and wrote the paper, I worked out for one that I was interested in creating an installation that reduced the visitor's visual prowess and promoted listening as a valuable mode of experiencing space and making one's place. More specifically, I wanted to use a whistling and steam-filled space to discuss the anxiety that places of waiting, both psychological and physical, elicit in us, and whether it is possible to feel at home in such places of physical, psychological, and epistemic suspension or immobility. The broken chinaware lining the perimeter of the installation was one of the more recently added elements of my piece, so I'm still working out on how to talk about it. Currently, I see a link between the broken chinaware in my installation and the broken chinaware in a piece that I made back in high school called You Must See It, Broken China, pretty straightforward, um, which shows two mirrored silhouettes of China mimicking the ambiguous shapes used in a Rorschach personality test and a sack filled with broken chinaware dropping to the floor from behind the canvas. In both these pieces, I can see that the broken chinaware functions as a very self-aware, hyperbolical visual symbol and verbal pun. Despite the blatant symbolism that suggests that the verbal pun be taken literally, I consider my use of broken chinaware as a place mark for that something that I still can't quite articulate about my relationship to my place of birth and my experience as a Chinese adoptee. The broken chinaware is kind of like the rubble or the dust that continues to linger after something has happened. It is a matter of memory that escapes legibility or historicization, but that makes past feel a little less distant, a little less abstract. With some triangulation or wordplay or whatever else I need, I can bring those traces into a moment of temporary legibility, just like I did for my installation. Thank you. Next, we have Odelia Cheng. Odelia is a BXA student, a junior in School of Art, who is studying art and biology. Uh, hi, my name is Odelia. I'm a junior BSA student studying biological sciences and art. Um, and my artistic practice is mainly attempting to combine bio biological themes into my artwork, um, usually involving the major categories of environment, biotechnology, and health. So I'm showing this piece um, because this was one of the first pieces that was a pivotal point in realizing methods in which I could combine biology into my art. Um, I was thinking about what would happen when biodiversity and, or many different species are lost and if we would attempt to recreate these species through technology to replace them. Um, what would our relationship with these new creatures be like? Um, and their relationship to their environment and would we continue to draw nourishment from them or their environment or would we expend our energy to nourish and care for them. So this next piece that I have kind of follows a similar vein in thinking about biotechnology making or enhancing life. Um, we can think about products like GMOs or transgenetics in which many different, um, in which animal and human genes are mixed together and these are usually used to optimize the property or exhibit a new property in an organism. So this piece was made in mind thinking about how a hybrid could be constructed to enhance a specific physiological trait in an organism. And for this piece, the specific trait was vision. Um, and so the organism has these enlarged eyes with a reflective layer in them so that the retina can receive maximal amount of lighting from its environment. Um, and additionally, the organism has echolocation capabilities and enhanced olfactory senses. And really with this piece, it was important for me to show how these senses would inform each other through nerve impulses and neural connections in the brain. So the past semester, I had read an article in which PETA had charged the University of Pittsburgh for animal abuse within its research labs. And since I'm also involved in research at CMU, um, it also made me think about my role in my lab and working with fruit flies, which is usually an insect people would never have like a second thought about killing. Um, they reproduce like crazy. Um, but this piece became kind of a deeper exploration of, um, of thinking about the merits of, of t taking a life to benefit another. Um, and also became kind of this spiritual despair for me about my own conflicts and not being able to understand the full capacity of the weight of a life lost or gained 
Um, and so this piece is actually very small, um, and I wanted it to kind of fit this role as a religious reflection object. So here's another fish piece. Um, this piece is titled The Last of Its Kind, and this fish is a hybrid between the Atlantic salmon, sea bass, and bluefin tuna. And these are all species of fish which are um, endangered. And so with this piece, I was thinking about the issues of overfishing, but more on a personal level. Um, even though overfishing is such an issue, I still indulge in eating fish and seafood, and people still continue eating these fish despite their status as endangered animals. Um, so it's really an issue of comfort, I think. Um, and so I place this fish in this personal space of a bathroom sink, and the lemons are just another symbol of consumption to add a culinary touch. And then finally, I wanted to touch on this interactive piece that I made to raise awareness of Pittsburgh's air quality. Um, even though Pittsburgh's air quality is infinitely better than it was in the past, we still have some of the worst air quality in the nation. And so one of the things um, that I'm looking to go into in the future is also scientific illustration. And one of the valuable things that I find from scientific illustration is its role in being able to educate people and um, to use comprehensive image images to pass on information. So I combine these goals um, in this flyer that I would hand out to people um, to tell them about air, air quality in Pittsburgh and also provide them some methods that they could protect their health. Um, despite the bad air quality. Um, I named this project Traveling Lungs, and it, it evolved to me becoming this kind of lung and nose persona. <laughs> um, and so I would travel around the city, and um, I would have these interactive experiences with people where I would um, have Q&A sessions with them about air quality and have them place like these black dots onto my lungs. Um, there you can see I'm talking with Charlie White. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, and through this, I would hope that people would take away certain methods that could protect their health. Um, so as I continue moving on in the future, I, can, I hope to continue exploring biological themes within my art on a more personal level and also on an educational level. Um, and I'm excited about these intersections. And yeah, thank you. Nana Chun. Nana is a sophomore BXC student studying art and global systems and global systems and management. Um, hi everyone, thank you for coming. My name is Nana and I'm a sophomore BHA student studying fine art and global systems and management. Today I want to talk about my experimental work online called Descent. It was showcased in the Lunar Gala Fashion Show in, in February. So what the main inspiration for this line came from, well, it begins with my interest in feminist studies and feminist readings on like feminisms and feminist theories, which eventually led me to feminist anthropology. So specifically, when it comes to anthropology, there is a section of um, the Field, where it focuses on marriage, family, and kinship. So when it comes to family, there are patrilineages and matrilineages. Patrilineal, um, patrilineal societies specifically focus on the descent of, or tracing the descension of like a lineage or a family through the male or through the man. So basically, um, these societies tend to give more power politically and socially to the male um, and Naturally, um, patriarchal, patriar patriarchal societies also arise. And these patriarchal societies are more likely to be heteronormative and less tolerant of women, and especially queer people. So these are some sketches of um, my experimental wearables. And basically what led me to these designs are I started looking at marriage, because marriage is kind of the turning point or the, what you would call a rite of passage to creating families, to creating lineages. And so I started looking at the marriage costumes of different societies that are, pat that are known to be patrilineal and pat um, patriarchal. I collected silhouettes, patterns, colors, and other symbolic designs from wedding costumes. 
Um, and some of the examples of the societies that we're looking at include Japan, Nigeria, and India. The resulting wearables from my research, and I want to emphasize this, are reconstructed ritualistic garments. So I took the cross-cultural gender norms that are attached to marriage, family, and kinship, and rearranged them in each garment. And there are eight garments in total in my uh, line descent. And they were worn by all bodies, no matter the gender or their identity or their sexuality. The resulting figures and the resulting um, performance um, came to emphasize a sort of androgyny, a sort of like a gender society and kind of almost a human. Um, and just to point out some of the materials I used, and these materials do stem from the visual research I have done. Um, or I use a lot of satin. Satin is a very popular fabric among um, wedding costumes in any society. I used silk organza cotton um, along with acrylic on canvas. This look in particular uh, is done all, on, um, all through acrylics on canvas, and these are hand painted by myself. The resulting garments combine art and anthropology to create political dialogue that challenges gender stereotypes and expectations. Descent helps to exemplify feminist theories and feminist anthropology in a visual language that is more accessible and perhaps poli more politically impactful for the everyday viewer. And I hope to continue this kind of methodology and process in combining um, research and theory to a more visual and maybe like continuing an experimental like wearable and theme um, throughout my practice here at Carnegie Mellon. Thank you. Thank you, Nana. Next year, Stephen Michaels, a sophomore in the School of Art. Hello, thanks for having me. Um, this is super exciting. Um, so today I want to talk about an uh, extended essay and collection of writings I did, um, which are titled The Phonetics of Mythology, um, and I did this during an independent study with Allison Smith. Um, so this is some of my work from freshman year. Um, this is a project I did utilizing the myth of Atlas, um, which is the myth of uh, the person who bears the weight of the world as a punishment. Um, and this got me excited about costume. Um, it was part of Scott Andrews' Activated Animorphs class, um, and the photo on the uh, right is from a performance at Phipps Conservatory. Um, so this got me really excited about wearables, but also about uh, enacting the drawings I was making. I always spent a lot of time drawing in my sketchbook, and I really wanted to understand my desire to continue drawing just um, sort of endlessly, and, and the way that I was producing images, and what their um, references were, but also the symbolism behind them. So I'm using the basis of phonetics and euphony, um, which are both have to do with the way speech and sound is classified, um, and euphony being the quality of being pleasing to the ear, which is something that is slightly irrational, and so I'm thinking about um, the euphony and phonetics of, of a visual language and the sort of irrational gravitation towards these constructs. Um, and I'm also thinking about um, the desire for artists to create individuated visual languages, um, both as a way of setting themselves out from a group of other artists, but also as a way of um, understanding and processing the world. Um, so I've been looking at a lot of historical and theoretical references, and these are some of them, but I also have been looking at um, Luigi Serafini and uh, Walter Benjamin, Marie de Bruguerol, um, and also a lot of time at the Rare Books Room in the library, which is an amazing resource that everybody should take advantage of. Um, so this is an excerpt um, that I want to read. The plane is just an extension of the mind, a physical formation of alternate modes of perception. It is a process of seizing an idealism out of blankness, although not necessarily by the violence of modernism. To utilize the freedom of this void is to gain an understanding of an alternate dimensionality. Any free movement of the marking instrument takes up the space of the unconscious mind, the physical world of space, and the idealized macrocosm of the picture plane simultaneously. So I've been thinking about um, the creation of an image as a gesture of allegory um, and what the concept of sort of a pantheon could be in terms of a visual language um, and how that is formalized in abstraction. Um, so the goals of this project were to interrogate the irrational desire to create images, as I said, but also as a contextualization of my methodology. 
Um, and realizing that my practice is one that is continuous and not a discrete project-based practice, um, because I had been thinking a lot about how um, all of my pieces really fit together and I've been working with a lot of compositional themes that uh, could kind of just keep going beyond where I stop them, um, and so the ending points are sort of arbitrary. Um, and letting the image come before the object, um, and using understanding of the archetypal symbolism, um, and looking to Carl Jung um, as a huge resource for that, um, who is a uh, philosopher. Um, and conjoining my writing and artistic practices, both in uh, my poetic writing, but also in my essay writing. Um, so this is some work I've done. Um, I've been looking at historical forms of composition. Um, I'm very influenced by the tarot and its dissemination of symbolism, um, but also looking to historical forms of composition, um, as you can see on the right, where I was looking a lot at Baroque portraiture, um, and the symbolism that is very heavy uh, in that language. Um, so I've also um, been looking at the creation of garments as a creation of a drawing, um, and allowing the body to become an enactment of a garment which enacts a drawing, um, and thinking about ways that all of those things can be contingent upon each other. Um, these are all garments I made, but I also exhibit them as paintings, because um, they are uh, flat um, until they are placed upon the body. Um, and this is a sculpture I made as a part of an installation. Um, it's called The Great Flood. And it was thinking about uh, myths that are concurrent throughout multiple civilizations, and one that is extremely concurrent is the myth of the Great Flood, which would destroy civilizations or start civilizations anew or punish civilizations. Um, and so I've been thinking about this as a sort of diagrammatic sculpture um, and allowing time to become a factor in a sort of, uh, this stemmed from a drawing and allowing time to insert itself into that image. Um, and so there's, uh, there's unfired clay in the basin that over time would uh, disintegrate into the water. Um, this is an excerpt from a poem I did um, by doing tarot readings on myself every day. Um, I'll just take a sec to read it. Columns rise before the presented, a dangling jewel, swinging pendulum, not time, the sword, the right, red, pooling ray, but a portrait of the queen, to bestow the orb, the abstraction of grassland in reverse, preserved atop the flow, six swords and a rod to push along the marsh, Puffing cloud revealed behind the stone to guarantee more arches to come, to frame and label a border, home war, the servants of the satyr, or a bat, a chain, a black cave. Um, and this is an excerpt from a nine page poem. Um, so, yeah, thank you for listening to my talk. Um, I am going to be publishing this book and it'll be available um, probably for very, very cheap because I want people to read it. So, um, <laughs> please contact me. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Next, we have Sachi Shah, a freshman in the School of Art. Thank you, Daniel, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Sachi Shah. I'm a freshman in the School of Art, and I'm currently pursuing a BFA with a minor in Entrepreneurship and Innovation. So I think one of the most interesting things about learning about artists is kind of tracking their transformation of the art processes that they work with and whether that coincides with monumental life moments or specific changes that they make in learning opportunities. So I came into CMU with a background in fine arts, um, traditional mediums like drawing and painting. You gave me a paintbrush and I was like in bliss. I was so happy. So I worked a lot in acrylic, um, watercolor and gouache. And along with like these mediums, I worked a lot with people. Um, a lot of my artwork was based on like the experiences I had in my own life, my friendships, my relationships, um, and like memories and these sort of experiences intertwined together. Whoa. Uh, but another kind of factor coming in with these characteristics of my artwork was the fact that I'm from Singapore, which is a little bit of a trap you guys don't know. Um, but what's really interesting to see is how I came in with these sort of defining elements in my work and how they shifted in Pittsburgh. Um, and so I found that when I was here, a lot of my work had kind of became about Singapore and my relationship with these two different homes. Um, so this is one of the pieces I created here. It was um, originally based on a digital um, collage I made and then I rendered it in more traditional mediums. Um, this was done on black colored pencil and uh, yellow acrylic. But it shows a scene of um, downtown Pittsburgh, which is one of the bridges, and Marina Bay Sands on the other side, which is iconic building in um, Singapore. 
And it shows kind of like this scene in a fishbowl type of setting with these scuba divers trying to figure out like where they exist in these two worlds. And so this is a theme that kind of constantly reoccurs in my work. Um, another, this is another digital collage. And it shows elements of all these kind of cultures which are fragmented, it seems. But to me, it kind of represents home. So you have like a map of Singapore in the bottom, and then you have a Turkish rug, and then for some reason, Moe and Shandong, and all these elements come together, remind me of home, in the backdrop of PPG Place, which is in Pittsburgh, if you guys don't know. Um, and actually, going back, there's also like the element of Chinese lettering. I learned Chinese for eight years in Singapore. I absolutely hated it. <laughs> it's an incredibly difficult language to learn. But what's so interesting is coming here, I've found that it translated itself in my work a lot. Um, so this was a uh, sculpture installation I made in Philip Scarpone's mold making class, and it shows a setting of a Chinese tea ceremony. And all of these cups are uh, molded out of wax sculpture, and I poured green tea on top and kind of see, saw how the wax reacted on top of this chessboard setting with values written in Chinese that have to do with Asian culture and how the two interact. Again, in Philip's class, I returned to this idea of memories and people, which are really important to me in my art practice. Uh, and I found a vintage Polaroid in Creative Reuse, which if you haven't been, it's a super cool resource here. Uh, and I found like a stack of like old Polaroid pictures, which is super cool because Singapore, if you don't know, is like a country which is only 50 years old. So this idea of having like a thrift store, a consignment store is so foreign to me. And being able to have the opportunity to draw from the past and kind of like remake it in the present is just an exciting new opportunity. But whenever I have the time, I will return to like where my heart is and that's in painting and that's in traditional arts. Um, and I guess I'm at the standstill where every day I'm learning something new. I'm learning how to use Rhino. That's one of the first, um, it's a 3D modeling software, if you guys don't know, but that was one of the first models I made using it, which, looking at it, it's so pathetic. It's just like a, like, it's just like a basic shape, but we were told to like reverse engineer it to kind of understand how it was made. And I was so excited, I sent a Snapchat to like all my friends. I was like, I know how to 3D model, this is so cool. But using the CNC router, the laser cutter to cut out font, for example, for text for that banner, Whereas in the past, I would have like laboriously hand cut it. So it was just an exciting opportunity. Learning programs like Illustrator, Photoshop, uh, Adobe Premiere, which kind of catapulted my interest in filmmaking. Um, over there, I have stills from a film I made in high school about people's passions and how they can like be visually manifested through body paint. And over here, I have stills from a film I made this semester about the red string and like human connection as a whole, which again is a theme that's, I think, constantly going to be prevalent in my life. Um, and learning new of systems and like resources we have, like Prelinger Archives, which is a large database of found footage that you can incorporate in your own work, um, which is really exciting. So I'm at this point where I have these two passions, I'm constantly learning something new, but I want to find a way for my love for traditional fine arts to kind of coexist in this rapidly changing world. And if I can do that, I think I'll be a very happy person. <laughs> so feel free to follow me for any, on any of my social media platforms or reach out to me. Thank you. And coming in right on time is easy. Uh, easy. <laughs> easy is a sophomore in the program studying art and cognitive neuroscience. Thank you, Izzy. Hi, uh, I'm Izzy Stefan. I am a sophomore in cognitive neuroscience and art. And this is my presentation about how I like to eat cake. How I like to eat cake. Here are some examples of cakes that I like. The more depressing the cake, the better. And the uglier and sadder, and the more frosting on the cake, the better. So I first started making work about cake in freshman drawing when I started putting frosting all over the wall. I think there's a really visceral quality to frosting. It's so beautiful and ornately done, but it's also just like pure sugar and butter, and if you eat too much of it, which I definitely did while I was making this project, you kind of want to throw up. So I did this project in concept of freshman year, and it was kind of my first performance ever, and of course it involved cutting and serving a cake to my classmates, like a controlling mom at a sad birthday party. Um, a semester later, I ended up making this collage based on a ginormous oil painting depicting a Sleeping Beauty-like folktale by a Russian painter from the mid-19th century. And 
I was looking at the connection between fairy tales and the uncanny, and somehow cake made its way into that, along with its counterpart, which was mold. I was noticing some aesthetic similarities between frosting swirls and nice fluffy white mold, which looks very edible sometimes. <laughs> I also found a lot of inspiring castle cake images, which you can see in the background. They range from beautiful and ornate and professionally done, like on the left, to kind of sad and phallic, as on the right. Um, this fall in printmaking, I made my first lithograph, and I was trying to incorporate found imagery. So I used this plan your bedroom worksheet activity from an 80s wedding planning magazine and interpreted how my ideal bedroom would look. There would be a lot of large babies and cake because those are just the things that make a home feel like a home. <laughs> Um, I also made my first screen print using a photo from my second birthday party of both of my parents simultaneously feeding me cake. <laughs> um, it, this work was kind of looking at the relationship between sugar and love and how sometimes later in life when I felt like I was lacking in that love that my parents had bestowed upon me at that young age, I would turn to sugar to fulfill my emotional void. Um, recently, I did a project on Instagram where I kind of parodied various types of food bloggers who make these really ridiculous images that are totally not ironic, but could be. And I ended up gravitating towards frosting and a lot of the images that I created, um, like bathing and frosting, um, using frosting to replicate adaptogenic coconut butters, and so on. Um, lastly, my most recent project involving cake was an actual full-on birthday party that I threw for myself. Um, not on my exact 20th birthday, but close thereabouts. And I did things such as send out invitations with a photo of myself at my fourth birthday party crying over a cake, cry over a real life cake at my 20th birthday. Um, I made this class photo, which has no cake in it, but the cake is like present <laughs> spiritually. Um, and I combined everybody's childhood photos of birthday parties, preferably with cake in them, to create this giant birthday party for that myself as a child would have always wanted, or maybe really not wanted. I'm not sure. The end. Here are more cakes to inspire you. Thank you, Izzy. Next, we have Yeh Kim, a sophomore in the School of Art. Stephen, you'll be going after Yeh. Sorry for the change in the area. So, um, I'm Yeti. I'm a sophomore in the School of Art. And this is basically how it all started. It kind of, the sculpture that I made in high school out of tea bags kind of sculpted. Uh, sparked this movement in the rest of my practice for like the last two, three years. And I think at first it represented something different than it does now. Um, it was mostly used to cope with um, my struggles or, or just like, it was a thing to like physically represent uh, my relationship with my mother, but now it's more like an obsession that's just repetitive sewing. Um, I try to use different forms of media to challenge myself in the comfort zone that I have, um, but still staying within the realm of this comfort that I do feel in using tea bags. Um, this specific performance was a little bit of a turning point in, in my practice because I've never done a performance before and uh, I feel like it made me want to push myself in a way that I haven't done before. Um, and uh, going from that, um, I just wanted to try other different forms of media to challenge myself. Um, 
And I feel like by making installations and sculptures, it helped me discover parts of myself that I couldn't understand before. Um, this, for example, um, I really enjoyed um, the product of basically what I made, and um, I was pretty satisfied with the result. But overall, um, what I valued more is the repetitive process of making this project. Um, this is actually set in, uh, on the bridge next to Shen Park. And throughout this process, especially the latter half, um, I found myself recording myself actually sewing the tea bags um, rather than being focused on how it was going to turn out, even though that was very important to me. And what ended up happening with that was a video that I made with um, my mother's voice uh, overlaid with it. Um, so I felt like this was successful and that it uh, represented this obsessiveness that I felt like I was having along with going back into my core uh, reason for even starting to work with tea. So next, um, the second portion of my, uh, my practice is this participa participatory work that tends to touch on people's uh, uh, basically like aspects about human nature and the faults or the complex the complexity of it, almost to expose their flaws or what society thinks as flaws. For example, I think crying is completely natural, and um, but like the problem with that is that a lot of people try to hide it or feel that um, it makes them weak, which I find really disheartening. So then I made a project uh, focusing on those on this weakness that people see. Um, so I had people poke holes where they cried on campus and then had them like write little snippets on the bottom. Um, some people chose to write about uh, like specific instances of why they cried, and other people chose to write things like, school is pretty stressful, so sometimes having a good cry is very therapeutic, which I found really wholesome and nice. Um, this other project is called To Change, and it was a fun way for me to comment on identity regarding fashion and the way um, that people's personalities or the way they uh, act around other people change depending on how they choose to present themselves. Um, it was also interesting to see the interactions between um, these people. Some people are strangers, acquaintances, or like really close friends, and putting themselves in like other people's clothes um, uh, was just like a way to I guess, physically represent this interactivity that I found um, very intriguing. Um, the second project, or this last project, um, was uh, a way for, so basically this is a wooden sculpture, um, like a, almost like a pod that was installed in Shenley Park. Um, and basically um, it was used to explore a public space as private. Um, basically doing things that you would normally do um, within like your own home, but putting it into more of a public space. Um, I, and I think to like sum it up basically, um, what makes my work worthwhile is um, the teamwork that goes into my projects. I really couldn't have done any of these projects alone. I had to help have people help me carry like parts of this wood to Shanley Park, have people participate in my To Change project and um, performance pieces. And even with my tea bags, um, people have collected tea for me for months and sometimes years. And to think that I would have to do this alone is, um, in a way, challenging and a little scary for me. And I think I, through my practice, I've learned to appreciate the people that I have in my life because they're the ones that really push me to continue with um, my practice. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Gideon. Thanks to Stephen Montier, our freshman in the School of Art. Hi, how are you guys doing? I gave a little cameo appearance you can anticipate the project. <laughs> um, so, I'm Stephen, I'm a video artist and a conceptual artist. Um, the pieces I'll be explaining today deal with the three subjects I deal with my practice, and those three are black culture a hip hop culture and thought processes. This first piece, these deal with appropriate works putting rappers in famous uh, paintings, there's 12 of them. And this touches on all three, and this, because this was before I actually got into this, this actually started me on the whole uh, thought processes part of my, my uh, <laughs> the whole thought processes part of my uh, practice, because I was submitting these for an AP exam until I realized, oh, appropriation is not really uh, looked, up, looked upon in a good way for like uh, 
academic matters. And I kind of figured out why not, why, why can't I not just go ahead and do this? So it made me against like copyrights and other things, but I started exploring um, what can and cannot be reproduced in art. Um, these, th these five pieces, this is the first three of the five, um, deal with uh, the perceptions of black people in America. And these are all made from old school hip hop covers. And a lot of my work deals with the process. And this process had me make these covers, made them, I made racist posters essentially. And I had to go back and make them in a positive fashion. And this is prevalent in a couple of my pieces about doing this process where I had to go and construct something, then reconstruct it. And a lot of the artistic values in it is actually not seen. For example, this piece. Um, my Do Not Copy piece goes against copyrights and what is an idea and who owns an idea. I'm a strong believer that anything in this world is fair use and can be used for whatever. The world is our public domain, per se. And so the process behind this piece was I made from a blank sheet of printer paper. I constructed this box, this rectangle, out of Sharpie. And then I scanned that into a computer, and I remade it digitally, then added on one piece of color to it, and then scanned that again, removed it, and added more until it came out to this, and I reproduced it on a mass level. And the whole purpose of that was to show that all ideas stem from either the same thing or a central theme. And to copyright something that wasn't technically yours to begin with, I feel is a false way to perceive life. Because everything is stemming from something else. And inevitably, somebody would either have that idea in the future, or you're just copying somebody's idea from the past. Um, going along with hip hop culture, because I'm just really into rap. So uh, this is the same concept as the do not copy piece. However, this deals with sampling and rap music. Um, throughout time. It starts with Amen Brother, which is a beat break, and there are 11 famous beat breaks that I use throughout music, and this is the most used one, and it ends with Outkast's Elevators, and along the way, it goes into some Mary J. Blythe song, and like Destiny's Child, and goes outside the genre and within the genre at the same time, exploring these paths and these thoughts of what connects and what's original. Um, so, here are my 3D works. I started exploring public pieces and like how to make public art. I actually made up 21 words. I am a visionary. And <laughs> <laughs> I made these 21 words and I placed these around Pittsburgh. And actually here's the next slide that shows two of them. Uh, I believe the, the concept of how to pronounce it is up to the viewer or the reader. While, while the actual definition remains the same. I combine two pre-existing words to create a new definition and a new word that is oddly specific. Um, and I put all these out in Pittsburgh, most of them are taken down. Some of them I had to climb statues for. You can watch that video, check my YouTube channel. Um, <laughs> and here it is. So, <laughs> uh, my YouTube channel is, I feel like the pinnacle of all my work because I started getting into video and I'm running out of time. So, I'm gonna move on, but like, I started going into video and here's one of the pieces I did. It's not playing. All right. And this piece, ask your videos was great. And I'll let you watch the first and I'll wait for the show. They talk in the back. You guys speak to the better. If somebody came up to you and asked you a question, can I help you? How does that come off to you as a white shot? Like for me, when people. So it's much easier to help you. I find it's a bit of a I'm actually going to stop it there because I have a little more than that. But there's a lot of people walking up to me. All right. Um, these are my other videos. I. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to go on to one last piece, and that is my. Uh, I do a lot of collaboration. I love doing collaboration. So I do have a sound club. And <laughs> I made a bunch of these instrumentals, and I'm encouraging people to go on and find these and uh, create a new work to be a part of a collaborative piece of work that I'm doing that's a lot larger. Here's all my information. I'm sorry I went over time, but I know you enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> Next we have a pair presentation from Joshua Carey and Sophia Viva. Hello 
everyone. I'm Sophia. And I'm Josh. <laughs> and we're sophomore BFA students. <laughs> so this semester, actually, last semester we applied for a small undergraduate research grant, and we got it. And <laughs> this presentation is to talk about the film we are working on currently. So get ready. So, um, <laughs> okay, so for our search grant, we proposed to pilot a short animated series about fairy tales um, and the social roles that they reinforce. And um, we're especially interested in fairy tales portrayal of women and uh, specifically women's work in textiles. And so we hope that our project would intervene on these social roles and um, suggest alternative ones to our audience. So the first component of this project was to research into some early publication of fairy tales. We traveled to the Houghton Library at Harvard University to view the rare book collection there, and we actually got to see an original copy of the second edition of the Brothers Grimm Fairy Tales, which is pretty cool, from the 19th century. And this is a cover of Andrew Lang's Blue Fairy book from the Houghton Library, which we also drew inspiration from to form our narrative. But, go. But uh, the best illustrations came from this uh, book illustrated by Gustave Dor for the Comte de Perrault, which are the next couple of slides. We were looking to find inspiration for the film as well as studying the history of the fairy tale itself. Um, some of these images here um, are from that same book that Josh mentioned. And we were also interested in looking at the original books to see how common traits of fairy tale characters and their stories have evolved throughout time. Um, each fable throughout history is seen to loosely follow a certain plot line and contain a certain uh, number of familiar archetypes, but each rendition of the story has distinct differences that makes it memorable. Here are Puss in Boots boots. <laughs> They're gorgeous. They're very pretty. Um, and, and we also drew from the uh, Carnegie Library, which has collections of Andrew Lang's fairy books. These are the crimson and green ones pictured here. Um, and we also were looking at Wanda Gag's illustrations from the Brothers Grimm, um, also here. And <laughs> let's talk about the thing we're doing. So. So this process isn't really as linear as we have mapped it out here, but uh, Josh can take that over. But there's a lot of back and forth between the scripting and the storyboarding stages and the, the voice recording and the scripting, and, and we have a little audio clip of, of what we wrote just to, to share. Oh, See it? Well, obviously not. This is filth. I hope by my next visit, you'll have created something I can at least use as a dish rag. Our voice actors are students at Let's CNN. see it. And uh, who you just heard was uh, Julia Marcus in the School of Music. So here we have a general storyboard of the entire film to show how the scenes flow. Well, and we also broke down each scene individually to show shot for shot um, how we wanted it to work. Uh, and here are some sketches for the set design for the carriage, which um, came about like this. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and here is another set that we've created. Um, and the basic aesthetic premise for our work is using um, a bunch of scanned fabrics to compose the sets and the characters. And um, this is our workplace. We're using the software Tune Boom Harmony Advanced. And we're actually layering these fabrics using the paint tool as if they were, you know, as if they were a single color. But um, we're using fabrics to compose our piece. So here we can show you a quick uh, sketched uh, animation of what we have, and while it's going on, Josh can tell us about the story. So, 
So our story is about a, a young seamstress who attracts the attention of the de facto goddess of our, our fabric world. And the, the master seamstress uh, punishes our protagonist and curses her to work on this tapestry forever. And the only way that our protagonist can earn her freedom is to reject the task that she's been assigned and, and challenge the master seamstress. So. But Josh and I are both uh, sophomores and we want to study electronic and time-based media and this project has really allowed us um, to work more with that um, outside of class without assignments and just focus on something that we enjoy doing, um, except we realize that frame by frame animation fucking sucks, but it's okay um, because I feel like in this current climate it's really hard to make our work that isn't, uh, doesn't have some sort of stigma or harmful message kind of can't avoid that, but I really appreciate the fact that we can um, try and make something lighthearted and wholesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to PSGN, a sophomore school of art. Hi, I'm Peter. I uh, make games and interactive media, and this past year I have reevaluated my views on games and the games industry. Uh, so, working on games is something I'd like to continue to do in the future. It's a labor of love, and I love games, and I love their potential futures. And then I see that I don't want to be regimented and sent onto a path that doesn't even give a shit about me. My role is commodified. I'm expendable, as I'm wound into a cultural machine that feeds us colossal, choking, economically considered remakes, sequels, nostalgia trips, that use predictive models to analyze what we want, when the market is hottest, to make hundreds of millions each year on their million dollar investments. The machine seeks realism, realism pushed to the edge, out of the uncanny and into your reality, to addict you to itself and keep you particularly satiated until the next investment comes next Christmas. 14 to 18 hour work days or coming in every day of the week for weeks on end is not really something that I'm interested in. Um, I don't care about working for a machine. Uh, I think that AAA needs to be rethought, that these massively multiplayer online RPGs need to be reconsidered. And I want to address this in my practice. Um, games are hard work, and I recognize that, and they require help. Um, and I want to include other people in my practice. I want there to be um, artists and programmers that also make games with me um, that aren't necessarily anything like me. Uh, of course, there's always solo, indie, master quest, vision style games. Um, but to quote Metagaming by Bollock and Lemieux, um, stories of sudden indie game riches are appealing. They have a fairy tale quality. The moral often, work hard and you will prevail even though this kind of overnight success is often the result of an unrecordable recipe involving privilege, education, talent, toil, and timing. It is hardly a coincidence that Indie Game the Movie's three primary examples of independent games were each personally funded projects produced by two-person teams of young white men inspired and paying tribute to classic Nintendo Entertainment System games from the creator's youths. So, I say throw the entire thing in the trash, get rid of tradition, and start over. I want to work with games that experiment with the medium more, and to work with people that um, are open to that, and that want to um, do their own thing, but also um, work with me and collaborate with multiple people. Um, this is a quote from Game Slash Play, which is by Mary Flanagan, who is an amazing writer, inventor, everything. Um, I'll, read, I'll just talk about that for a second, but play culture is the way in which participants engage in active subversion of many computer systems, and second, the way in which players perform and play with and on such sites. So games, or metagames more appropriately, extend, absorb other input and communities. Um, they offer a complete analysis of systems. Um, we live in a society of control, built on enclosing structures and disciplinary action into sophisticated and entangled systems. We have a complex, data-rich drive that, that drives our lives um, to control us. Games are in, I'm interested in because they subvert this expectation that comes with computer systems. They allow us to um, experience the system and to beat it by understanding it. 
Um, so this is a game I made last year. It's really nice. It's about uh, it, I made this with a lot of amazing people, and it was my kind of first foray into game development and trying to figure out exactly what I wanted to do with it, because it's difficult to program an entire system. I had so many people to help me. Um, this game is essentially set in a dream where the narrative repeats. You play as an epitome that is trying to uh, vanquish its opposite, and in doing so, becomes it. So, and it's just a circular narrative that keeps looping. But I think it was an interesting start. Uh, this was a game I made for a game jam in collaboration with Julianne Fields and Allison Trailer. Um, it's a dating sim where you play as a, the influenza virus, and your goal is to find eligible vectors to infect with your disgusting disease. Um, this is my first foray into systems-based analysis and criticism. Uh, it's essentially a modification of Monopoly where you play as the health insurance industry, um, uh, fittingly. Uh, so I didn't, I didn't want it to be didactic, but it ended up being kind of didactic. Uh, you essentially bid on people going around the board and betting on their uh, getting hurt and you treating them. Um, this is uh, a project I did where I started my own game jam in an effort to get more people to participate in games that wouldn't appeal to a massive market, that would appeal to um, very niche communities. Um, and I think it was, it was, uh, it was something that I want to keep driving forward. Uh, and this was a very recent project that, again, I collaborated with Allison Trailer on. Um, this was a, this takes place in an infinite field where um, you essentially find hallucinogens and go on crazy trips. Uh, but the idea is that that's the only escape from this um, ever-expanding infinite field. Um, I, think, I think that I want to keep exploring systems in the future, and I, just because I know I'm out of time, uh, I'm going to read this quote really quickly. Control is not discipline. You do not confine people with a highway. By making highways, you multiply the means of control. People can travel infinitely and freely without being confined while being perfectly controlled. And I think this is what I want to keep exploring with games and the systems that we can replicate. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Next, we have Eva. Eva Kling is a sophomore in School of Art. to my show. One day in the middle of the night, I decided to create this project. Um, after about two days of melting sugar into molten caramel, I poured it onto myself, still boiling, and spent the rest of the experience reorganizing the sugar into the following vessels. It's kind of rabbit-like. When I look at myself, I think of rabbits having sex. <laughs> uh, now meet Lala, pronounced Layla. She is a feral girl living in a sterile world where people forbade sexuality. This image is a portrait of her recent miscarriage, which she is struggling with. This project is a failed experiment to see if incredibly suspicious and destructive behavior on a moving plane in the sky from Detroit to New York City, um, the site of other plane-related incidents would cause any alarm, but considering uh, my race and uh, gender, unfortunately, um, no one batted an eye at this performance. I ended up wearing this green screen suit obscuring my face in the airport and on the moving plane. And um, no one asked me about it or uh, was alarmed in any way. One of the flight attendants, her name was Mary, I asked her to help me with my homework and so she recorded this uh, performance on my iPhone. So yeah, see that there's like passengers in there just, just doing their own thing. I like to make a lot of work about myself. Um, almost everything I make is definitely a self-portrait. Um, this in particular is a alphabet of my secrets. For example, B. B is four. Ava was never breastfed. Um, my mother actually fed me goat's milk with honey. Um, it looks something like this. This is just a short clip of some of the things that happened. It loops endlessly, and 
Um, if you wait for it, you'll, you'll see the beginning, which is this. I also um, do some painting sometimes. Um, I'm currently focusing on the absurdity of my childhood memories and with highly suburban themes. Um, here I'm on my deathbed, lost in the desert, dehydrated, starving, with vultures circling around. Um, this is the last mirage I see, a you know, larger than life pair of red heels. This is uh, another painting. Um, this painting in particular is pretty interesting because um, it's about my last three significant others, all of which I fully peed myself in front of and none of them noticed. Um, so furthermore, uh, this year I participated in Lunar Gala. I made a, a low collection um, called Trevi. Uh, Trevi is the French word for work. Um, the collection uses the semiotics of traditional menswear from you know, white collar silhouettes to the everyday workman to the schoolboy. Um, I wanted to question um, what menswear means um, in this context, especially like feminine silhouettes and, and how femininity can be empowering for men and women. This is a another picture of that event. Um, I, I labored over this for a long time and I'm still recovering, honestly. Um, the, the hardest part, I think, was, um, was sewing each letter of, this, of the blue jacket individually on. It, um, there are uh, something like 72 different letters. Um, also, uh, goodbye, and thank you for your time, and um, have a nice day. Thank you, Ava. Next, we have Jackson Bridges, a song from the School of Art. Hello, my name is Jackson Bridgers. Uh, I'm a 20-year-old human man, and uh, I'm on a quest to get a bachelor's degree in fine arts. Here are some of my photographs. <laughs> you know jellyfish for like the beginning part of their life live like basically attached to a rock like a plant? I took all these photos uh, with basically a telescope uh, from Flagstaff Hill. And then I combined them all into one big collage. You'll see that in a second.
Here's some more photos. This is from LA, uh, standing on top of a mountain near my house. Uh, just, you know, one, one spot. Took these photos from one spot. <laughs> I haven't yet made these into a collage. This is a video uh, of the Pittsburgh freeway somewhere in Oakland. So this is the same panorama deal from earlier, but uh, with some actual videos also. Thank you very much. Hi. My name is Daniel. I'm a junior in the School of Art studying Business and Science and Art, and I have the unfortunate privilege of closing tonight's amazing presentations. I work a lot in social practice, and for those of you who are wondering what social practice is, I found a quote recently that sums it up pretty nicely. It is by this artist called Bryce Dwyer. Um, social practice is when someone devotes an extraordinary amount of time, energy, and attention to relationships between people. And what kind of started this whole social practice interest was this project called Project Homeless, which I did in 2016. These are cups um, shaped by the hands of people experiencing homelessness in Pittsburgh. As you hold and drink from these cups, you are connected to the hand of a homeless person. Holding that hand, drinking from the cup, I wanted to create a relationship between the public and communities in need. And um, all these cups are for sale, and all proceeds um, go to its funding shelters and homelessness um, awareness programs and street outreach programs in Pittsburgh. There have been about 100 cups sold so far. But for the longest time, I struggled really hard with the ethics of this project um, and many other social practice projects I was working on. Was I using these men for my own advancement? Was I improving their lives? Was I helping to solve homelessness in any way? These were questions that often plagued my mind, and these were non-existent. There are non-existent answers to these questions. Do I have the right to enter these communities and take from them and try to understand their struggles when I haven't had, when I haven't had the same experiences as they have? And um, how does this differ from social work? Does it need to? Does it have to count as art? Where do the boundaries um, fall in place? And so I spent a lot of time trying to figure out these questions by interviewing people, by talking to strangers, by interviewing people that have bought these cups and use them consistently, seeing if the presence of these cups in their lives has changed the way they behave or perceive homelessness. And I got some answers, but none of them were really concrete answers. And I stumbled upon this quote uh, recently, that the issue of whether or not something is art is hardly ever the central concern. That is not ultimately what is at stake. And so for me, trying to figure out what is at stake took a while for me, and it was an experimental process of me trying out different things and working on different projects with the homeless. And what I eventually found um, was when I was working with one of the men who was making the cups of me, 
And after a while, he turned to me and he said, hey, dude, I'm kind of sick of making these cups. Can I make an ashtray instead? And that kind of hit me. So then, from then on, I started, um, the idea came from there. I started going to the shelter every week and bringing down materials for the guys to then express themselves in any way they wanted to. Um, it got off to a pretty rocky start because in a men's shelter, um, masculinity is your only currency, and so art tends to be pretty low in terms of value. Sometimes the men would come and be really interested, sometimes they would come and just ignore you for a day, and you never know what to do. And um, initially, I was kind of troubled about whether this project was going to take off until I met this guy called Ken. And what he told me was that don't try to think about doing something big, or don't try to attempt something phenomenal. A lot of the people in the shelter have seen people come and go, and all you need to do is really just keep showing up. And so I did. For two years, I've been showing up week after week, bringing materials to these guys, new guys, old guys, the guys come and go, or they stay. Um, but this really isn't about me being a good person. This talk and this sharing is more about me trying to understand the struggles in social practice and trying to understand the power of art and the power of just showing up again and again. So this over here is Warren. He has a picture of his teenage daughter everywhere he goes, but his ex-wife doesn't want him to see the kids. The red panda is her favorite animal, and he spent a few months working on this painting to give to her, and he's going to present it to her next month when he moves into his new apartment. This is Bay. So shelters, the way they work is that they typically are set by sex and not by gender. And as a queer resident, Bay had a hard time settling into this men's shelter. The other men refused to call her by her chosen name. They made fun of her open back dresses. They made fun of her dressing. And once she came up to me and she said that, I'm an astronaut. And I said, what? Why are you an astronaut? And she told me that um, she's often traveling between planets and often feels like she's in limbo, like an astronaut would. This is a painting I made of Tommy. Tommy hates to be photographed. He's my longest friend at the shelter. He's been there for two years since I started volunteering there. Um, recently, I stopped going for two weeks because I was away at spring break. And what Tommy did, um, Tommy, when I came back, Tommy stopped painting. And he stopped showing up for like the next three weeks. And I asked him why he didn't join us anymore. And he said, you guys come and go um, like I'm a stepchild. You guys come in, show me some love, and you guys leave. And he was joking. But then um, the next week, we had a frame show at um, the Sustainability Weekend frame show. And so I asked Tommy if he wanted to show some of his work, and he's like, yeah, sure, but he was kind of reluctant. So I framed some of his paintings and put them up for show, took some photos and, came, and went back and showed the photos, and he laughed at them, picked up the canvas and started painting again. Is this art? Is this effective? Is this solving homelessness in any way? These are questions that I still haven't found the answers to, but I just know that I should keep showing up. What began as a two-week short-term project evolved into a two-year-long ongoing program but I feel like that's the only way to create real relationships and create meaningful work. Next month, sorry, next semester, we'll be expanding this program to a women's shelter, so if anyone is interested in volunteering, please contact me and let me know. To end on my presentation, I have this quote, um, art will not solve the structural inequity we see around us today, and to expect it to do so diminishes our understanding of the more profound potential for art's world society. I'm more interested in charting intentional directions towards mysterious, and unachievable ideals than I am in just taking on noble problems that I think I can actually solve. Thank you. So this semester I'm taking an object theory class with Alison Smith, and in the beginning of the semester she asked us this question, how do you define art and what makes art? And one of my classmates, Jameson, he's a grad student, he says something along the lines of, art is your visual philosophy, and that really clicked with me. And so tonight, all the presenters that came, came on stage and talked about their work were sharing with us their own unique way of viewing the world and their own visual philosophy and their own way of putting art and life into a visual language. So thank you for sharing that with us. And thank you to all the audience members for coming out, listening to them, and mapping out this complex role and complex systems in little bite-sized pieces to make living a little bit easier.